Hi, and welcome back to the Los Angeles International Film Festival. So that was Dream Big, the wonderful, inspiring documentary by Mark Martinez, who I am thrilled to say he's joining me today. Hi. Hi, Natasha. Thank you. Hi, Mark. So great to have you. So we've just all been watching the, your fantastic film. Tell us how you came to make this this film how what was the inspiration behind the story uh it's it's I, I don't know if i could pinpoint it in in one thing specifically but obviously uh the time i spent at, at gold's gym when i was a, a teenager had had made a, a an impression on me and it was something that was part of me uh, through my life even if i was wasn't training or involved, it was still kind of, I would always revert back to um, either situations I came upon or people I met or lessons I learned. Um, right about the time that I decided to make the film, which was about six years ago, um, I was kind of, uh, you know, kind of like in a life rut in terms of career uh, and in terms of, of other things. And I was, it's just where it's, um, it's those points when you're like, okay, uh, cavalry isn't coming. No one's going to save you. Um, so what are you going to do? Are you going to, are you, are you going to live this way for the rest of your life? And, um, I work in a TV station and I was, I was actually in the control room that day. And it was one of those public service shows that they show at off hours, you know, which, uh, uh and there was a gentleman there who had written a book and his name was Mike Murphy. And he's speaking to our community affairs uh, anchor person and she's interviewing him. And he's talking about how he took his life from just rock bottom to uh, he's a gentleman who runs a cancer foundation and helps women uh, with with no resources get cancer treatment. He has a healing center and he has two car dealerships. And my first thought, you know, the cynical me is like, OK, if I do some background search. This is a guy that's probably got like a $500 million trust fund. And, you know, it finally kicked, you know, and, and he's going to, you know, paint himself out of his corner. And um, anyway, uh, that wasn't the case. So I'm like, if this guy's for real, I want to meet him. And uh, since it was, it was a local community affairs show, I know he was local. I found out that he was actually um, close to the same city where our TV studios were located. So I go on his website and I see he offers life coaching. So I take down the number, I call it. He was on a couple of other national uh, radio shows and a talk show. So I'm like, he's busy. I'll never hear from this guy. Uh, one day I come down about a couple of weeks after that and there's a phone message and it's him. And um, anyway, we had like a 40 minute conversation. Uh, two days later, I'm sitting in his office and we have a long conversation. And at the end of it, he says, um, if you could do something in your life right now, what, what would you do? And I said, um, I want to make a film. And he goes, what would it be on? And the, the, the idea for Dream Big, Big came out. And so that's my long convoluted answer as to <laughs> how I got it. But that was it. And, I, and it was kind of like I've been telling people, it's um, kind of like you're just kind of dredging as you're like in a river and just combing away. You're just, just brushing away the silt you know, in, in a riverbed and, and, you know, going back in your mind and memories and one thing jogs another. And um, it, I, it was a wonderful journey for me. And, and I hope it shows in the film too, because it was, uh, I think, a special time and a place that can't be duplicated. Um, I mean, you could say that about certain other places uh, around the world for, for different movements, uh, for sure. Um, but um, yeah, that was the initial I guess fire that got me started. Yeah, no, it definitely comes across. It's such a, an inspiring documentary and, you know, changing your life. I just, you, you talked about, um, is it Mike Murphy? Yes, yes. So tell us a little bit about the other people that you met on your journey creating this film, people who were featured or maybe those who weren't. Tell us about how you pieced this all together and your progress for making the film. 
Um, well, um, you know, my terrier is trying to get in. Can I let her in real quick? Oh, Hold on, just a sec. She's scratching. Okay, come on. Sorry about that, Natasha. She was going to scratch the whole interview. I'm so sorry. So, um, one, because I think being on the internet, and I was out of curiosity perusing these these fan sites that speak about certain subjects and bodybuilding being one of them. And um, I don't know if you've ever had this, this experience, but when you see either history being misreported or changed or people getting facts wrong, um, you know, it kind of, it, it kind of irks me. And um, I was seeing a lot of uh, just conjecture uh, about that era. Yeah. And um, my first thought was, wait a minute, I was there. I mean, I was young, uh, but I was there. And so I said, I'll try and reach out to some people and see where they're at. Because I, you know, I was 17 when I joined the gym and, and myself and a couple other young guys were almost kind of like mascots, you know. Um, and so we were uh, we weren't contemporaries of the national level competitors or professionals. So they were always very kind and open with their advice. Um, and you kind of form friendships at that point. So, um, you know, one was, uh, the owner of the gym, Ken Sprague and his wife, Marion were, um, uh, very kind and generous people. Um, there was, uh, a, pro a professional bodybuilder named Bill Grant, who, um, to this day, Bill, um, still trains every day. He's 75 now. And, um, and, and, um, I told Bill, I go, the seat, you know, your secret to life is, is one, you, you know, he likes to exercise, but you like people. And I said, there's a lot of people that deal with the public that really don't like people. And I said, you enjoy being around them. Um, Charles Gaines, who wrote the book Pumping Iron, which is a, um, a very inspirational book in terms of uh, the way it was written, but um, he did, he attacked that from an intellectual sense. Uh, Charles was another uh, uh, great interview because his world was uh, out of, you know, uh, literature, basically, he's an author. Um, and so his perspective, as well as Ken Sprague, who was a gym owner and businessman, his perspective was wide. Um, John Balick, who I interviewed, who was a photographer and then became a magazine publisher. Um, he had a great perspective and I enjoyed spending time with him. Um, and then I've met people along the way who weren't in the movie just as this thing built momentum and they heard about it um asking if they could lend a hand you know and and so that was to me very encouraging and inspiring because uh you know there's that self-help guy or basically uh up from your bootstraps napoleon hill a gentleman in the united states and he i mean he's long since passed but he always had these quotations that were start where you are with what you have and keep going and what you need will become available to you as you go is to basically get started, just get started, stop talking about it and get started. So um, uh, I found that to be true, you know, as, as um, I was able to initially interview five guys and then word spread, and then it was easier to get more people to interview. And I think I eventually interviewed 16 16 or 17 people. Um, and that's at least an hour for each interview. You know, I have like 18, 19 hours of interview footage that I've called down. Um, so, but I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a wonderful journey, um, uh, reconnecting and also meeting new people. Wow. That's really a lot of people and a lot of footage. So, for, for all of us who don't know that much about maybe documentary filmmaking specifically, how do you go about constructing a film with that much footage and that many interviews? How much of that is pre-planned and how do you go about editing that and the choices you have to make? Um, I've, I've, I've jokingly said to friends, I could write a book on how not to make a documentary and how not to market a documentary. Um, you know, like I, I, we had mentioned earlier in the pre-interview, I've worked in television for 30 years. And so I've done camera, lighting, audio, 
um, uh, video editing. But in terms of constructing a long, a long form documentary, while I love documentaries and have watched them, and I figured I could do that because I understand the structure, when I finally came down to it, um, I realized something <clears throat> is that the story that emerged was not the story I thought I was going to have. Um, it, 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 and that surprised me because I think for almost the first year of editing um, and um, Ken Sprague's wife, Donna, she did, she painstakingly transcribed all those interviews for me in documents. So I had them as reference and I would highlight them and then I would search for the sound bites. And um, what I found was the most interesting part of every person's interview was not necessarily the nuts and bolts of, well, today I got up and you know, I was training for this contest and I had to do chest and back and this is what I did. You know, no one cares. It was more about uh, what was the inside of that person's head like on that day? Uh, why did they love this? Why did they leave? You know, uh, some of them left family units behind. You know, they're, they're leaving home for the first time, saying bye to mom and dad and driving across this, you know, the United States to a crazy little burg of Los Angeles called Venice, which was back in those days considered dangerous and, and, you know, just a seedy place. Um, but I was surprised, I was happy with the way the story came out. And I think I, once I trusted myself, once I stopped trying to force it, like, this is what the story is going to be and just let it, you know, it sounds corny, but it's almost like the, the story emerged by itself. Uh, just putting everyone, I think it was following the emotions of every uh, interviewee. And then there, I found there was a common thread there. And I think that uh, kind of held it together. Um, but yeah, um, uh, arduous process, but fun uh, for me anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Also you capture the essence of, of that part of LA in that, in the time as well. So tell us a bit more about how you did that. Oh, well, um, when I, when I um, first read the book, Pumping Iron, I was a freshman in high school. The book actually had come out that year. And um, <clears throat> one of my um, high school football teammates actually brought the book to school. And, you know, when you're 14, you're looking at these photos of these big muscular guys. And especially back in those days, there was no reference for them. There was very, very few bodybuilders and they were, they were looked upon as, <clears throat> as Charles Gaines, who wrote the book said, it was kind of looked looked upon in the same milieu as midget wrestling and the roller derby, you know, uh, they were considered freaks or losers. Um, but, um, um, looking at those photos and reading and reading the pros, um, and I'm like, Oh, it's Venice, California. That was like less than 20 miles from my high school where I was at looking at that book. So as I was looking at, you know, and I, and I would go out, you know, to, to, Santa Monica, you know, my, my aunt and my mom and my, you know, we would go, we would go out there because there was a, a seaside pier and there were shops and restaurants, but you know, most people like don't go a little South to Venice, stay in Santa Monica. But when I saw the photos in the book, I, um, being a local, I, I knew what those days were like, you know, I'm like, Oh, that's, that's a foggy Marine layer type of morning in Venice and Santa Monica. You know, I could basically tell you what that smells like because, you know, the Venice strand is like one block away from the street where the gym is at and you could smell the waffle cones and the hot dogs or, you know, and, and so, um, it kind of, uh, those pictures transported me and, and they do now as I've, as I've gotten older, uh, you know, cause that, that, that Venice is now gone. Um, but, um, I think one being having been there, gone out there and joining the gym really helped because when you kind of swim in the soup, so to speak, you, you know, you, you know, you know, the tenor of the times, you, you know what the feeling was so that, I mean, that helped. I don't think if, if I wouldn't have been involved directly, I wouldn't have made, I wouldn't have felt like I had the authority to make that, you know, that film. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit more about any other challenges or highlights from making this film that you personally found? Well, um, it's, it's always been a challenge in the sense that, um, um, well, you know, Mike Murphy kickstarted me with, with some funding. And so 
um, I had told him, uh, let's, let's get the most from the least because I can pretty much do everything. I can, um, you know, shoot, I can, you know, interview the guys, I can set up the camera, I can light it. I've got the audio. I wouldn't do that again <laughs> because, um, uh, there are interviews, you know, where I've got the headphones on so I could listen to the audio I'm recording. Um, I'm looking at my camera to make sure that it's framed and in focus. And then I'm also trying to engage with the person I'm interviewing. And then of course, then you have to download the footage. And, you know, so I was, I was a one man band and, 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 but at the same time too, I'm like, well, you know, tons of people have done it that way too. And if you want to, if you want to make it happen, that's kind of how you have to do it. So that's, that's always been a challenge. And then, um, it, you know, it's, it's, I think the time it's, you know, time and money, you know, because I've, uh, I've, uh, you know, with the family, you know, a couple kids and, you know, they have school and my work and trying to carve time to edit the documentary in between, you know, other, other, you know, life obligations, it, it, it gets tough. And uh, of course, you know, it, you know, the money crunch too. I'm um, my friend that, that wrote the music, you know, he, he wrote the music. He also did the illustrations and um, <clears throat> that was something that came out of, <clears throat> excuse me, out of necessity where I'm like, I really don't, there's no B-roll that exists of these stories that these guys are telling. Um, and I don't want to have a lot of talking heads on screen because that's boring. Um, my friend is a wonderful illustrator as evidenced by his work in the film. Um, <clears throat> but we also didn't have the money to do full on animations where we'd be able to do cell animation. So I would have to just kind of like animate one shot by slightly moving on it. So that was a challenge and that came out of uh, necessity. Um, some of the highlights, I mean, the, the highlights were reconnecting uh, with the guys or learning things about them that you didn't know, like what they were going through back then, you know, when things are wonderful on the outside and, and what they're dealing with in their personal lives and being uh, open and vulnerable and sharing that um, was, was, was nice just as a human connection. Um, and for me, uh, another one was uh, meeting uh, Charles Gaines. Uh, I, I obviously knew his place in history in terms of, of this. I mean, he was, he was a guy who was a writer and uh, he wrote for magazines as well as novels. And while he occasionally exercised with weights, he certainly wasn't in the bodybuilding world whatsoever. Um, but through an article he wrote for Sports Illustrated, he met Arnold Schwarzenegger, a young Arnold in the early 70s. And then that led to making the book Pumping Iron and then brought Charles into that world. And I, I think without, well, I, I'm sure without Charles or, or George Butler and the photographs in that book, um, that world would have never been exposed to the level that, that it was when it enjoyed that notoriety. But meeting Charles and being able to spend time with him was, was definitely a highlight because we spoke about so many other things, um, you know, outside of just, you know, his work in, in, in bodybuilding. And, um, uh, that was for me, uh, just an enjoyable experience. So, um, that was, that was a highlight. Oh, that's fascinating. That, yeah, it sounds like very, a, a fantastic experience. So tell us what's next for the film and what's next for you. Well, right now I am um, <clears throat> trying to build momentum through these film festivals and th thank you. Um, I was contacted by um, a person who's a friend of a client and she had produced um, a 1990s uh, sit uh, sitcom. Uh, well, not necessarily sitcom. It was, it was a comedy variety show on the Fox network. And, and she's kind of, helping me along through the process of like what you're going to need for a pitch, you know, if, and when we get in the room to, to be able to, to get this distributed widely and so, and, and sold. So that's, that's basically like the, the, the uh, pressing order of business. And in the background, I'm in pre-production now making notes for my next film, which will be on um, the music industry in Southern California from about, the late seventies into about the mid eighties. And it's gonna run parallel to a, um, a radio station in Los Angeles, um, which um, 
it was called KROQ, I think they're still on the air, KROQ. Um, <clears throat> but they were one of the first band or one of the first uh, radio stations uh, actually in the country. And when they first started, I remember listening to them on the radio and then I would tune to the frequency on the dial and they would be gone. And, you know, I'd ask my older brother, like, hey, you know, what, what's, what's going on? And he says, oh, yeah, because they don't take advertising. They don't take money. They just go off the air. And when they get more money, they come back on the air. Um, so that's how they started. But that was kind of the mindset for a station like that. That's like, not only are we winging it, but we're going to play music that not everyone else is playing, you know, because uh, we've all seen the trajectory, right, of a band that's small and then has got their devoted audience. And then if they click and get big, then all of a sudden they kind of become what they were rebelling against, so to speak. And that happens, you know, as obviously in the music industry. And so, you know, <clears throat> when you only have so many outlets for music and they're only going to play certain bands, there's no chance for new voices to come in. So K-Rock really championed that uh, in the early 70s and, and, and early, mid and late 70s into the 80s. Um, I think a lot of the bands from, from the UK got their first airplay in the States, uh, in Southern California on K-Rock. Um, you know, like, you know, the <clears throat> Spandau Ballet, Flock of Seagulls, Duran Duran era. Um, I think that was their, their breakthrough and bands of that ilk. Um, <clears throat> so that's making, I'm make, making pre-production notes on that and, and starting to call people and find out who's got posters, who's got footage, um, you know, uh, how many people want to talk, <laughs> how many people don't want to talk. So that's, that's my next one. Fascinating. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. How can we find out more and keep up with what you're doing on that film? And also the one dream big that we've just seen, do you have a, do you have something online we can keep up with? Well, yeah, I have um, <clears throat> uh, dreambig.com, uh, I believe is my website. And on, I'm on Body Surf Bliss on my IG. Uh, let me see what my actual uh, dreambigdoc.com. Yeah. And I've got a, that gives a synopsis of, of the current film. Um, I don't have anything up for the next one because I don't even have a title yet. Yes, but uh, <clears throat> uh, well, one more thing, if I could add, when I am. Um, when I was kicking around the music thing and it was like, it's been like about a year and a half as I'm trying to bring this one into the station and um, meeting people from around, from around the country, from around the States. And I would mention a band or I would mention something and they would like, who was that? I never heard of that. And I'm thinking, well, we're, we're in the same age group. How come you didn't hear that? And then I, I started to realize that, people from other parts, even in large cities, even in like San Francisco or New York or Boston or Chicago, they weren't getting the same music as we were in, in Los Angeles because of KROQ and the club scene, the music scene. So that's, I think that's when I'm like, oh, you know what? I, that's something to really tap into uh, because what happened was um, when KROQ did start taking, uh, you know, if they have to stay on the air, they have to make money. Um, they drew the interest of a, um, um, a syndication company, Westwood One Radio. And what Westwood One Radio did was like this formula basically dragged people away from dinosaur arena rock into new music um, almost single handedly. Let's clone this and take this program format around the country. And so I think that was the impact of that mindset and that and that station. So. Um, again, I guess that was the impetus to really get going on on this second one. And I don't have I don't have a title yet. <laughs> so when I do, I'll, I'll put something up. So Amazing. Well, that's brilliant. It's good to hear that you're you're already working on the next thing and hopefully we'll be able to keep up with that. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Mark. Oh, and thank, thank you, you to the audiences as well for for listening. That's excellent. And I hope everyone enjoyed the film as much as I did. Well, thank you. And I'd just like to say, if people want to connect with the festival more, we have a website, which is www.laiff.org. And we're also on socials. We're at, uh, 
at Los Angeles IFF on Twitter and Instagram. And we also have a Facebook page and a group. So you can come and chat to us on there and let us know about your thoughts on this film and also on all the others as well. So come and join our community. Thanks very much.